It's time to retire this Solidoodle 2. Let me show you how 3D printing used to be. These days, 3D printing is as popular as ever, especially among hobbyists. These days, you can jump online, get something like a CR10 and get pretty good prints straight out of the box. It wasn't always like this, however. My first experience with 3D printing came in 2004. I was in my final year studying industrial design at UTS and in the workshop, Stefan and John were excited to get their brand new FDM printer. This bad boy was enormous. It went up to the roof in their office and it was probably about a meter by a meter in width. Despite costing $80,000, from memory the print quality wasn't really much chopped by today's standards. I remember receiving a prototype model back of something I was designing for my major project and it was covered in support material. By the time you peeled off all the support material, the model inside was pretty average, especially considering how much it cost us. That didn't matter at all, however, because this was brand new technology and the uni and me and all the other students were so excited to have it. Fast forward a few years and the RepRap movement was really gaining pace. RepRap meant that it was self-replicating, which means if you had one, you could print most of the components to print another one. 3D printers back then were pretty ugly. The main RepRap model was the Darwin, which looked pretty dodgy. It had wires going everywhere and the prints, I think, were pretty rough. MakerBot was also getting started in doing its thing. Its early printers, the Thingomatic and the CNC Cupcake, were pretty similar to the Darwin. At this stage, 3D printing was definitely only for the hardcore tinkerers. Then MakerBot released the Replicator 1. It looked pretty good, the build surface was a decent size, it seemed reliable, and compared to everything that came before it, it was really revolutionary. They also had Thingiverse, where you could get models and anyone that owned their printer could print out some cool stuff. I convinced the school I was working for at the time that we should buy a Replicator 1, and we did. And around that time, I decided that I needed to own my own 3D printer, so I got researching. There was nowhere near as much choice as there is now, and I stumbled across the Solidoodle 2. For only 500 bucks, I was sold. I'd have my own 3D printer to use at home, and had a heated bed and everything. Solidoodle were promising plug and play out of the box printing. Well, anyone who's 3D printed knows that that's quite often a lie. Now back then in the world of 3D printing, some things were exactly the same and some were completely different. Something that varied dramatically to today was the slicing software. There was no Cura and there was no Simplify 3D. Back then, even Slicer was brand new and not many people were using it or even trusted it. The slicing engine of choice was Skeenforge. This was open source and from memory it was based off Python. I didn't use it for too long before I switched to Slicer, but let me tell you I remember it being so slow. Because it was so slow and inefficient, iterating and improving your G-code took a very long time. Until you were sure of your settings, you had to dedicate probably half an hour to slicing a model until you were happy with it and you were confident that you could get it to print. Now another thing that was disappointingly accurate for how 3D printing is today was how dodgy that Solidoodle were in shipping their units. Even though Kickstarter didn't really exist back then, I ordered as a pre-order and the lead time promise was pretty reasonable. What myself and the rest of the community found, however, is that Solidoodle was in no position to fulfill all the orders that they generated. From memory, the promised lead time was about four weeks, but people were generally waiting over three months to get their unit. The forums were lighting up with angry customers and a lot of people were thinking about getting their money back. Fortunately, for at least those first round of Solidoodle 2 printers, they were all eventually shipped. Now you might have noticed this model looks completely different to the models I've shown you so far, but it did start life as a Solidoodle 2 expert model. As you can see, I've spent a lot of time modifying it. Let me take you through that journey. The first thing I knew I wanted to add to my printer was an LCD panel. The hot version back then was called a Panelolu. I ordered one before my printer came, thinking I would poke around in the firmware, enable it, upload, and then be ready to go as soon as it came. Much to my dismay, I found that Solidoodle were using an older version of the firmware that didn't have support for this. When me and other members of the community reached out to them asking for it, they weren't interested at all. As far as they were concerned, the printer was shipped working and there was no need for a user to do any updates. Frustrated, I started delving into the code properly. With the help of some other members of the community, I ended up hosting the official Solidoodle firmware for a couple of years on my own GitHub. This was pretty typical of Solidoodle's approach and how the community really propped them up. Without proactive members of the community on places like Soliforum, Solidoodle wouldn't have been anywhere near as popular as it was back then. It was really amazing to be part of something where the community banded together to overcome the limitations of the supplier. It was around that time that I released my first file to Thingiverse. It was a case and magnetic mount for the Panelolu that could go into the Solidoodle 2's outside metal case. I was pretty proud of it and I was definitely hooked by the modding experience. Next up, I decided to improve my print quality by adding a fan. 
At this stage, I was using Google SketchUp, so it was pretty challenging to model one, but I eventually was successful. I released this to Thingiverse, and it was very well received by the community. Frustrated by filament tangles on the back of the machine, I then got to designing a filament guide. It clipped onto the PVC pipe on the back of the printer and stopped the filament from getting jammed and getting stuck in between the machine body and the filament spool. After that, I turned my attention to designing a heavy duty case that magnetically stuck onto the outside of the printer to cover over the electronics, which in the initial version of Solidoodle were mounted open on the back of the case. Now, any original Solidoodle 2 owners will remember the horror that was the acrylic jigsaw extruder that came with the printer. It was pretty clever in its design because all the pieces were laser cut and designed to be stacked up on top of each other to make something much thicker and fairly functional. The trouble was as soon as you got a jam, which wasn't infrequent, it was really hard to pull apart, hence the nickname Jigsaw. Once again frustrated and looking to improve the printer, I remixed the design on Thingiverse to create my first Jigsaw replacement extruder. It was extremely popular and it really built my credibility in the community. I mucked around toying with some little mods like an upgraded Z screw holder and then I got into the real stuff by iterating the design for the jigsaw replacement extruder. Mark III offered huge improvements because it had an accessory mounting system on the front. Soon after I released a fan that went with this. Solidoodle as a company was offering nothing but fortunately myself and other prominent members of the community were really pushing things along. Thanks to us their printer was becoming really popular. People that were worried about buying them would come across the forum and know that they had their backs covered by all the support. My Mark IV version evolved things even further. The front was completely open, which means you could slide out the entire hot end to clear clogs very, very quickly. Compared to the original jigsaw replacement, this thing was a godsend. The next problem I turned my attention to was the extremely slow heated bed. This would be the first time that I would make my own electronics PCB and I had a crack at designing my own bed. It kind of worked and it did heat up a lot faster, but it was unreliable. I purchased a DC silicon bed and then I designed and printed an adapter system where it would sit on top and allow the original plate to go over the top to stay flat. Around this time, I was really trying to push my knowledge of all things 3D printed. I found a program called VizPrinter, which ran off a Raspberry Pi and offered cloud connectivity. I modified the web interface to get it looking how I wanted and I forked a version on GitHub. I then designed a mount where a cheap PengoPad 700 tablet could connect to the printer and control it with its LCD touchscreen. Now that was pretty swish, but myself and a lot of other users were having trouble with Z-banding. The Solidoodle by default shipped with a normal threaded rod and nut. There was a lot of backlash and a lot of inaccuracy in the prints. I changed out the original threaded rod for an M5 version because it was much, much smaller and therefore the pitch was much narrower and the backlash reduced. There were some little things like a little trumpet shaped thing that fed the filament through the case safely and also a door handle for the factory door. Although it was a simple design and didn't make that much of a splash, in my opinion, it's one of the best things I've ever designed. It clipped together in two pieces, required no screws, and it just worked so well. As I'm sure a lot of 3D printing folks can relate to, this was becoming an obsession. I decided I wanted to upgrade the electronics to ramps, so turned my attention to adapter so it could mount in the factory spot on the back of the case. After this, I went completely bonkers because I decided I wanted to redesign all of the factory gantry and carriages. I then modified a cable chain that I found on Thingiverse to suit the Solidoodle and everything was looking pretty cool. Never satisfied, I redesigned the extruder, now with the Mark V. It had a new clip-on accessory system and I designed a new fan to boot. And then another one because I thought I could improve it even more. Around this time something really interesting happened that you might not have seen before. Community member 2N2R5 released a threaded ball screw. This used one of the polished hardened rods mounted in a package with bearings and it spun around magically despite there being no thread. I remixed my own version and it worked pretty well for a while, but eventually it weared and I switched to the ball screw that you see here. The printer was still prone to missing steps halfway through a print and ruining them, so I figured the less weight I could have it moving around, the better it would print. At this stage, I decided to go to Bowden. I modified the extruder to take an E3D version 6 and moved the extruder stepper up to the top of the frame. I think that was the last mod that I released publicly, but that didn't mean I wasn't doing crazy things behind the scenes. One of the most interesting things I did was replace all of the rubber belts with non-stretch high tensile fishing line. By this stage, I think I was actually insane because I was investing so much time to make such minuscule improvements. I moved the Y-axis stepper motor to the outside of the machine to eliminate one belt. And craziest of all, I made this acrylic enclosure that moved all the electronics to the underside. Part of that mod was to also move the Z stepper motor to the underside too creating more Z height for the printer. This was a bit of a flawed mod because I lost access to the SD card and it also made working on the printer very difficult. You might also notice that due to wiring in the way, the upper and lower half didn't quite line up. 
Over the years I experimented with Captain Tape over aluminium, glass with hairspray which I worked successfully with for many many years, and more recently this build tack surface which I'm pretty happy with too. Very recently I decided to switch from ABS to PLA and I haven't looked back. That means I no longer needed the custom acrylic windows that I'd made to magnetically clip to the frame, but that's okay. So after all of these mods, how did this printer actually print? For most of its print life, this machine has gotten me pretty good quality, as evidenced by this Benchy. This gold Yoda is also really nice, but there is a major problem. You can see that there's been a large layer skip and the head is ruined. That was the real problem with this printer. For all my work that I put in, I'd find that every now and again I'd have a bad patch where prints would shift and they'd be completely ruined. It was very, very frustrating and I thought maybe it's time to upgrade. In December I ordered a Prusa i3 Mark III kit and in the meantime I bought my Audi 3D printer. Fortunately there's still some pretty good parts on here. I can recycle all of the cooling fans and the stepper motors too, which are actually twice the resolution of the ones that it came with. Even though this printer is now going to be retired, the important thing is it was such a big part of my 3D printing journey. In a parallel universe I might have given up at the start and decided that its finicky problems weren't for me, but instead I endured, collaborating with members of the community, making great friends along the way and learning so much. I think that just about wraps it up, so hopefully you've learned something about the way 3D printing used to be. You've probably got your personal favourite model of 3D printer that you staunchly support and spruik all the time on social media. Please remember that all the enjoyment you have 3D printing today is on the back of communities in the past who advanced the machines and created the market in the first place. I strongly encourage anyone watching this to look for a community and positively contribute. If you're unable to design your own parts and mods, then appreciate the work of others. When they post things up on Facebook or Thingiverse, hit that like button. Tell them how much you appreciate it because I've probably spent a lot of hours getting it right and releasing it for free. Thanks for watching and happy 3D printing into the future. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.